All right, so the final part of our five-point program, International Cooperation for a New Financial Architecture and World Economic Development. This is a Chinese proverb that was cited by the Chinese President Xi Jinping at the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in September this year. And I want you to keep this thought in mind as we're going through this final presentation today. Um, some people say Australia should be completely self-sufficient and just shut itself off from the world, because we could be, and if the rest of the world just goes to hell, then we'd be okay. But that is a grave mistake, in fact, and it would be a great tragedy. If civilization is to survive, and indeed to advance, we need to work together. There is a lot to be gained from it, as you'll see. And this thinking, this shows the thinking of Xi Jinping, but it's also beginning to emerge, and in fact we're quite fortunate to have some rather extraordinary leaders in the world today. I mean, we've been kind of in a cultural dark age for a long time, so it's actually somewhat surprising. Um, so I want to give a few examples of that kind of thinking being reflected. Uh, this is another Chinese proverb that I think summarises Xi Jinping's philosophy in that uh, we have a lot to gain from bringing forward the great diversity of different civilizations and gaining the best ideas from them. And at the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation Summit in China in June, uh, this is what he had to say. He said, while we keep hearing such rhetoric as the clash of civilizations or the superiority of one civilization over another, it is the diversity of civilizations that sustains human progress. Indeed, mutual learning between different cultures is a shared aspiration of all peoples. We should champion equality, mutual learning, dialogue and inclusiveness between civilizations. It is important that we overcome cultural misunderstanding, clash and supremacy through exchanges, mutual learning and coexistence. Now, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, echoed those thoughts at the Shangri-La Dialogue <laughs> where amidst a lot of uh, thinkers who were on the opposite side of the page, on the clash of civilization side, he spoke out against the age of great power rivalries, which is what uh, various US, UK and even Australian military security doctrines have declared as the greatest threat to us. Uh, and instead, he said, the world summons us to rise above divisions and competition to work together. Asia of rivalry, he said, will hold us all back. Asia of cooperation will shape this century. So each nation must ask itself, are its choices building a more united world or forcing new divisions? We are inheritors of Vedanta philosophy that believes in essential oneness of all and celebrates unity in diversity. Truth is one, the learned speak of it in many ways. That is the foundation of our civilizational ethos of pluralism, coexistence, openness and dialogue. He said, this world is at a crossroad. There are temptations of the worst lessons of history, but there is also a path of wisdom. It summons us to a higher purpose, to rise above a narrow view of our interests and recognize that each of us can serve our interests better when we work together as equals in the larger good of all nations. Uh, now, Russian President uh, Putin also came up with a similar theme at the World Russian People's Council. This was on the 1st of November, organised by the Russian Orthodox Church. And he said that mankind must organise its affairs so that each unique civilization supplements and enriches the other. Saying that it is easier to rule the peoples who are disconnected he asked, will this be a world of monologue and the rule of force or a world of dialogue and mutual respect? He said, it is impossible to imagine the history of humanity without such unique civilizations as India, China, Western Europe, America and many others. It is really a multifaceted complexity where each facet supplements and enriches the others. So these are all three different voices coming up with the same philosophy, which is rather remarkable in today's world. Now, that is not exactly echoed in the rest of the world. However, um, it is beginning to take off more and more because of the reality of the world crisis that we're in. And so you have 
Uh, the Japanese president who was in Beijing in October, Shinzo Abe, Abe he declared that the Japan-China relationship was moving from competition to cooperation as they engage with China in Belt and Road projects in third countries. And he said, we want to work with China for the peace and stability of the world. He said, China's economic development is a huge opportunity and shall be welcomed by both Japan and the world. And the Japanese signed 50 memorandums of understanding for joint projects that day. Um, now, if US President Trump were to be able to break free of the straitjacket which is on him right now of the anti-China, anti-Russia, pro-war cabal, you would find that that sort of thinking would resonate and would spread because the US desperately needs development anyway, but it would create a much greater potential beyond just potentials for the United States, but the potential for a great power alliance between the major, most populous nations, the US, uh, China, Russia, India, Japan, and then others that would easily slot in behind that. And major American firms are already working on Belt and Road projects uh, in Africa and China and elsewhere. Caterpillar, General Electric, for example. And 180 US companies attended the first China International Import Expo in Shanghai uh, in early November. And this weekend, we were hoping, of course, that Putin and Trump would meet. Uh, that won't happen, but hopefully there'll be good progress out of the Xi-Trump meeting. Now, that's, so that's the kind of philosophical coherence you see as a backdrop. And now I want to talk about the practical side of bringing a new financial architecture to bear. Um, so China, of course, is a great example of what a new economic system could look like. And in a moment, you'll see what the Belt and Road, or a little bit of what the Belt and Road has unleashed in just five years. China's banking system made this possible. There's no other you know, thing, significant thing behind it. Glass-Steagall, which they were implementing as other countries were getting rid of it from 1993. Other anti-speculation laws, a very high level of bank regulation and state-directed credit for infrastructure. After the 2008 global financial crisis, China you know, made, they, they were actually thinking about getting rid of Glass-Steagall prior to that, certain thinkers were, but they had it when the GFC hit and that reinforced the real importance, central importance of that and so they've kept it, strengthened it even. They conducted a study of the global financial crash post-GFC and they recognised uniquely across the world that the split between the financial system and real productive activity, the real economy, was one of the leading causes of that. They also began to push for a reduced dominance of the US dollar. They counted the quantitative easing spending, which was flooded into banks and therefore increased the inequality that already existed in the world. And they started to put quantitative easing into real development to uplift people, which you've seen the reduction of poverty by nearly 800 million people over there um, to, to actually reduce inequality. At the G20 meeting, which is in the picture here in 2016, uh, basically Xi Jinping put it out there on the table, we want to share this method that worked for us with everybody else. And he called for the G20 to forge a new path of economic development, saying we can no longer rely on fiscal and monetary policy alone. At Davos in 2017, Xi criticised the philosophy and model of globalisation oriented to profit making. He said governments must chart the right course for economic globalisation as we do with our people-oriented approach. And then following the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation meeting in June, China, uh, a, a US academic reported on the new financial mechanisms and institutions, including the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the BRICS New Development Bank, and the Silk Road Fund, along with a new organisation, the SCO Development Bank, and a 30 billion yuan special lending facility to be set up by China. So they're building these new institutions. At the Chinese International Import Expo in November, Xi declared the forum was a brainstorm for reforming the global economic governance system. And he said this reform is picking up speed. So he's used every opportunity to promote this, to hope and pray the world would pick up on it. Uh, now, at the BRICS summit in South Africa from 25th to 27th July, 
it shows you this is beyond China because the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa are picking up on it and there was a lot of progress made to trading in their own local currencies which means not being dependent on the trade being conducted in US dollars. And the Russian Minister of Economics, Maxim Oreshkin, called for a deep integration of the financial system of the BRICS countries to make this work. Uh, and they invited other countries, other African leaders and so forth were there. So they're expanding that process to what they call BRICS Plus to bring more countries into this potential new financial architecture. China and Russia have been working very closely on this, particularly to um, bypass the US dollar. And China's, uh, Russia, I should say, has divested about $80 billion out of the US dollar. Um, this is a Putin advisor there on the right, Sergei Glaziev, who we know very well. He led a group of Russian intellectuals to participate in the China-Russia economy dialogue in China in July discussing a new era of economic cooperation. He said, Russia must learn from China's economic experience. And he wants to send Russian government ministers to China for internships to learn their approach of a credit system, Glass-Steagall, etc. So Russia and China are also developing a national payment system as an alternative to the SWIFT of bank payments uh, and moving to honour each other's national credit card systems. There's also a new development with a currency swap arrangement being set up between China, Japan and the Southeast Asian nations to protect local currencies uh, in a crash. And this originally came about after the Asian financial crash. It was called the Chiang Mai Initiative, but it's now expanded and it's also including countries like India. So there's another institution there as part of this new platform. Um, Modi in India has started challenging the author or the independence, I should say, of the central bank. And so he's been in a fight with them there. Of course, they defeated Bailin, as we saw earlier. Um, one of the central bankers' comebacks to Modi was, we have to be independent because, um, you know, we don't, we're not subject to the whims of the people because they're not elected. You know, the problem with the politicians, they come up to elections and they start saying, we need to spend money on you know, the people <laughs> which Modi's been talking about. So with all of this, the prospects for a new Bretton Woods conference to create a new financial architecture are very high. And bear in mind that that does include very strong factions in the US, UK and Australia, who are all people working with us. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I want to give you a very quick um, glimpse of the stunning transformation of the globe in the last five years despite no real Western contribution and in many cases Western sabotage. Uh, trade between China and the 61 Belt and Road nations grew by 13% in the first three quarters of this year, year on year. Some 60 new economic zones and infrastructure corridors have been created, adding 245,000 new local jobs. Now I want to start a little tour and this doesn't do it justice but you can get more detail in this report which is available on the book table and as you can see it's, <laughs> it's long so um, just a few highlights really. So in China itself you have of course the major advances in rail which will be 30,000 kilometres of high speed rail within the next two years that they'll reach. Um, you have stunning advancements in uh, water projects, highways, bridges, nuclear power, fusion development, transformations of agriculture. This is an example of where the Chinese have just announced a breakthrough in growing rice in salt water. Um, they've got unbelievable, they've got miracle oats which can draw salinity out of the soils as well to improve the soils. They've got your space project. Um, of course, they've got moon, moon landings. Going to the dark side of the moon is the next project. The space station. Um, you've got their radio telescopes and satellite programs, new cities and inland development, you know, which is uh, a great parallel of what we could do for Australia to utilise some of the inland areas, anti-desertification programs and other scientific and technological advances. This is China's just completed bridge to Hong Kong, which will open up a whole new high-tech economic region between Hong Kong and Zhuhai and Macau on the Chinese mainland. It's comprised of 55 kilometres of cable stayed bridges, an undersea tunnel, access roads and two artificial islands. 
And the $20 billion infrastructure project used 400,000 tonnes of steel, enough to build 60 Eiffel Towers. Wow. In um, Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, China is building high-speed rail in Indonesia, in Laos, Malaysia, Thailand, with connections between, along with other infrastructure. They're building dams along the Mekong River system through Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Myanmar. And if we can get to the next slide. Uh, the Kra Canal is gaining support. This is to reduce transit time and congestion in the Malacca Strait. The Philippines has just joined the Belt and Road Initiative and signed 20 agreements with China. Uh, this is the, a plan to develop South and North Korea. The UN has just waived sanctions so that South Korea can begin to move forward with this uh, to develop the peninsula. Neighbouring Chinese provinces to North Korea want to extend the Belt and Road into that region. At the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok in September, a cooperation cluster between Russia and South and North Korea was discussed. Plans for a Russian bridge from the mainland to Sakhalin Island, which you can see on there, and one from the southern tip of Sakhalin to Hokkaido in Japan were discussed. Add this to the China-Russia gas pipeline nearly completed and oil pipeline completed this year and a Moscow and Beijing agreement to build a high-speed rail line between the two. You also have the China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor agreed in 2016. And as, just as an example of the Central Asian development, which is too much to go through, um, there are now 52 rail routes between China and Europe which have completely transformed the Central Asian region, opened it up with rail hubs, special economic zones, dry ports, increased trade, new gas pipelines and oil refineries, and it's uplifting and transforming the entire region. Now moving to India, India-Chinese relations are improving since Modi and Xi met in Wuhan, China in April. And on 23rd October, China and India made new agreements to enhance collaboration. Um, there's a series of new ports which China and other countries are investing in as part of the Maritime Silk Road, the Hamban Toda port in Sri Lanka, the Gwadar port in Pakistan and Djibouti in Africa. And there's also Chabahar port, which I don't think is on the map, in Iran, which India, Afghanistan and Iran are developing. So this is to enhance the development through this entire region. Uh, you have the North-South uh, Transport Corridor, which is the red line there, which you can see the, how it shortcuts on the usual trip on the blue line, which is a crucial new route. Uh, with Pakistan, the new Prime Minister Imran Khan said before he was elected, I want the Chinese model because what China has achieved is incredible. And then you have, of course, with Pakistan, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It's being reviewed as part of the normal process of a new government coming in. But on the 24th of October, the National Bank of Pakistan signed a framework agreement for cooperation of the, on the Belt and Road with the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. Um, in the whole Middle East, uh, Southwest Asian region, there's a lot of potential. This is just to show you one example with Syria, which is the plan to integrate Syria into the Belt and Road, which, which China is very oriented to. And then you have other things like the Suez Canal expansion that took place in the last couple of years and a Suez Canal economic zone with uh, Chinese investment. Uh, oh, this is the next video. This is Africa now that we're looking at. Um, so this is a bridge in Mozambique which the Chinese have built which has just been finished and there's actually a number of other bridges as well reported in the alert service. Um, Xi Jinping de describes Africa as the world's most promising region in terms of development potential and that this year's um, uh, FOCAC summit which is the China-Africa summit in September, many new agreements were signed to develop Africa with a focus on industry and manufacturing and Putin also has called for, he said, we want to light up Africa with nuclear power. Um, there is an African Union China plan for an African integrated high speed rail network. And we can go to the next slide. Um, this is a map of the potential African highways. It's a UN map and this coheres with where the major railway lines would be and already completed by China are a series of things. This is a railway line in Ethiopia, a railway line in Kenya, railway line in Nigeria. There's another one in Angola Kong and the Congo. 
Uh, there's extensive plans for East African economic corridors. This is an East-West corridor and much, much more. Uh, there's prospects for the Transaqua to go ahead now because an agreement was signed between Italy and China to proceed with planning the project. There's other hydropower and water management schemes, food security schemes underway. There's an, a stunning array uh, of development happening across Africa, which is just, you know, thank goodness for the, for the people of Africa. Now, coming to Europe, um, as I mentioned, there's 52 new freight routes between China and Europe. In August, the Hamburg-Germany to Wuhan-China route marked 10,000 trips. This is the 10,000th train since March 2011. And there's new routes coming online all the time. I had a list of them. I had to cut them out. Um, this port is in Duisburg, Germany, is one of the um, indicators of how this, this Silk Road development is causing the the development and the real thriving of Germany. This is the world's largest inland port on the Ruhr and the Rhine River. Italy um, is moving with this. The economics ministry has launched Task Force China to establish cooperation with China for <coughs> development and trade. Um, Portugal and Spain, there's progress. They are both very keen, although Xi Jinping's just been in Spain and they did not officially join the Belt and Road, citing the European Connectivity Initiative, which is a one of the US-UK influence initiatives to counter, really, the Belt and Road. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a historic terminus of the Silk Road and there is a lot of support for it in Spain and in Portugal. Uh, in Eastern Europe last year, the Central and East European countries convened with China to discuss Belt and Road collaboration, um, had enormous success. Greece is working very closely with China. Of course, China has expanded the Piraeus port into the largest container port in the eastern Mediterranean. South America and the Caribbean um, have been hungry for development and there's been a lot of agreements signed. You have um, uh, these canals. The Panama Canal was expanded in 2016 and the Nicaragua Grand Interoceanic Canal. It's got Chinese funding but it's also facing a lot of opposition. It's scheduled for completion in the next couple of years. Along with the Kra Canal and an expanded Suez Canal, we have a very exciting prospect of a one world ocean opening up a whole new level of global connectivity. And so that gives a whole perspective to the Maritime Silk Road and beyond. Um, there are other commitments in South America to construction, for instance, of a South American uh, bio-oceanic rail corridor with Chinese participation, prospects for a north-south rail corridor, high-speed rail links, uh, between various cities in Mexico, for example, establishment of science cities focused on research, nuclear power and other advanced technologies, new deep water ports and much, much more. Um, and this is without, as I said, any significant US, UK, Australia assistance and in fact with a lot of interference. And this is what Australia has to be thinking about. The whole point is that China does not want to do this all alone. As I said, you know, through the presentation, they've had taken every opportunity at every international forum to say, look guys, this is the method that works. This is the credit system. This is Glass-Steagall. This is how we need to frame a new financial architecture because they know if it's only them developing, they're not going to withstand a new global financial crisis and a global depression or a dark age. So we need to jump on board. 